as mentioned, I'm Ron James, and I'm with the Center for Ethical Business Cultures. I'm going to put you in the shoes of a leader, and the purpose of this exercise really is to examine how different people can take different approaches to solving an ethical dilemma. So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to take the first 20 or 25 minutes. I'm going to give you a quick scenario. I'll take two or three minutes to give you that. Once I give it to you, I'd like for you to decide what you would do without talking to anybody else. Go with your gut instinct. Now, I'll give you the punchline here. There are no wrong answers, all right? There are multiple choices of right that I'm going to give you in terms of solving this dilemma. But I want you to go with what your gut instincts tell you. Don't worry about what anybody else is thinking. Just what intuitively what you do in this situation. Once you've decided that, write down one or two reasons why you made that decision. Once you've done that, then I'm going to ask you to pair up in groups of three or four with your neighbors, hear what they decided to do and share what you decided to do, and then see if you can arrive at a consensus within your group. It's not mandatory, but if you can't arrive at a consensus, do. We'll take five or ten minutes and then we'll come back and talk about it as a larger group. As you listen to your neighbors, so I'm going to ask you to engage two principles. One, again, be candid with your point of view, regardless of what it is they decide to do. Secondly, I want you to respect their point of view, not just to listen to it to defend your own, but try and get inside of their point of view and own it. And if it causes you to change your point of view, you have license to go ahead and do that. Okay, everybody ready? Those are the instructions. It's uh, election season, so in the spirit of election season, we're going to put you in the position of being a newly elected mayor to a city called Happy Hills. Happy Hills is a suburb of St. Paul, Minnesota. You've just won a bitterly contested race in which you rode into office on a theme of integrity for change. During the campaign, it was rumored, never proved true, but rumored that your opponent, the predecessor, was allegedly taking kickbacks from a local construction firm. Doesn't matter, you've won the election, you're now in office. You've appointed your directors, department heads. In the first meeting where you gather them together, your public works director brings up a seemingly small but interesting matter. Turns out that 20 years ago, Happy Hills built a brand new water tower. This water tower immediately became a nuisance. Why? Well, the local high school students like to climb the water tower and paint graffiti on it just before they played the annual football game with their arch rival, Blue Mound City. Now, the prior administration tried everything to stop this practice. They put fences around the water tower, and the kids simply climbed the fence. They put signs up on the fences, and the kids ignored the signs. They even took the ladder down from the water tower, and the kids brought their own ladder. This was a dangerous practice. Somebody could fall off and get hurt. It was a costly practice, because every time it happened, you had to use taxpayer dollars and send somebody up there to clean that graffiti off. Finally, about five years ago, the prior administration comes up with a new approach. They put a sign up that says, keep out, extremely dangerous, high voltage. Of course, there is no electrical charge in the fence. But it seems to have worked because for the last five years, nobody has been known to climb the water tower and paint graffiti on it. <clears throat> Your new public works director brings this up in this, your first official department heads meeting with all of your directors. As the new mayor of Happy Hills, I'd like for you to make a decision. Would you decide to take this sign down or alter it? Or would you not take the sign down and leave it exactly as it is? Go with your gut instincts, decide what you would do, jot down a couple reasons why, and then remember, I want you to pair up in groups of three or four and hear from everybody else, see what they decided to do, and then see if you can arrive at a consensus in your group. Okay, um, in the spirit of the election season, I'd like to do some polling. And so uh, before we kind of discuss this, um, remember, we've got multiple choices of right that's going on here, so there are no wrong answers. 
I'd like to see the hands of individuals before you had your group discussion that selected the first option, let's take down the sign or alter it. Hands of people who made that choice. All right. Okay, and hands of people who said, nope, let's leave that sign exactly as it is. Okay, so we're almost 50-50 here. I'd like to see the hands of groups that reached consensus. So maybe half and some are still talking about it. Some sort of did. So consensus is 100% of people agreeing to go along. So we got, we got still a little dissension going on in some of the groups. All right, next question is, how many people heard some new information that you hadn't considered when you were making your decision privately once you had the group discussion. Hands of people who heard some new information. All right, maybe 60% of the group, 70%. How many people changed their point of view based on this new information that you heard? Maybe, maybe, maybe 10%. Move toward center. How about Move toward the center. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about this for just a few minutes. And I want to start with those who said, let's take down the sign or altering. What discussions did you have? What did you think about personally or as you started your group conversations? What was your rationale, please? Who will share? Yeah, please. Well, our, our group just decided that, you know, you, you ran on a platform of integrity yeah. or change, yeah. and the signs just lie. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> We so, so we same thing. Yeah. You ran on a platform of integrity for a change. This sign's a lie. It's not the truth. Okay. And so you feel you need to take some action. Okay. Yeah. Other thoughts? Reasons? Yeah, please. Well, I, I, I thought about it that way that it was what would happen if everybody suddenly believed, you know, started doubting uh, signs. I mean, that one, they weren't going to get killed if they touched it because there wasn't any power with it. Mm. But what if you're at the power station and they say, I have all these signs. So if you have these kids starting to believe that all these signs are lies are made up, is that what you want people so, to think about? Yeah, so is there an unintended consequence? Yeah. If the kids should discover that this sign is really a lie and go down to the street to the local power plant where the sign really is true, might they get harmed then? So maybe you better take action so there's some alignment, some truth in the sign from place to place. Yeah, other thoughts, please. I just ran on a platform that to change integrity. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally within my realm to do it. Yeah. Clearly, your predecessors got this reputation going on of doing things that are not steeped in integrity. That's been your platform, and here you've now got a chance to make a decision. You want to stick to that? Yeah. Please. Water tower is a sense of community. People have been doing that for years and years. Yeah. So keep going with that. Why were, were you on the side of taking it down or altering? Taking it down, so okay. that they could continue with that sense of community. Ah, okay, all right. <laughs> all right. So you would want them to go ahead. I mean, the kids have learned how to come together to put in graffiti up, <laughs> and so you want them to be able to continue. Well, that's the a adults youth. do this children in that community. Yeah, we've done this with tons of groups. That's the first time I've heard that approach. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I like it. Please go ahead. Kind of along her same lines of that sense of community, I just thought take the sign down, but then make it more of a supervised, controlled activity, uh -huh. so that the youth could still have their outlet and be able to go and do their little ritual before the game, but in a controlled, safe environment. Yes. Yeah, so you change the ground rules, maybe take the danger out. So you still take it down the sign, but you're going one step further and saying. The kids are a pretty important stakeholder here. How do we make sure we're still serving their needs? Yeah, very good. But Any the other insights? Are still there I'm sorry? There's a danger in unsupervised climbing of this tower. So one of the, I wanted to just alter it, make it look very similar because you've already got a deterrent in place. Yep. And change it so it is an honest statement that just warns of the danger, but same color, same lettering, same amount of words, same look. So what would you change in the sign then? Yeah, take out the high voltage. That would be one way to make the sign true mm -hmm. uh, because clearly there's danger in climbing, uh, but that would be a way to change the sign to make it true. You yes. could add the voltage and then the sign would be true. Right. Yes. <laughs> well, that's nice. I heard that cinema kind of going on here too. 
Yeah, you could just shock the kids, put a little voltage into the fence and make the side true. Low voltage. Low voltage. Let's, let's flip to the other side. I'd like to hear from those who said, no, nope, let's leave that sign exactly as it is. What was your rationale, please? I thought that there were unintended consequences of allowing them to continue to climb. If they continued to climb, clearly somebody sooner or later would probably get hurt. Yeah. yeah. So this sign has served a purpose. It's kept the kids off the water tower. If you take it down and now they start to climb again, somebody could fall off and get hurt. Great point. Yes. I much the same thing is that after five years, it seems like if they've left it alone, which is what I understood. Yep. I think the community, the kids, know that they're really, somebody's testing. Uh, I have to believe children test things. Therefore, <laughs> I think they know that there isn't any voltage. Ah, so, so they may have discovered it. They, they, they <coughs> found out either the hard or the good way, whatever, and, and they know that it isn't there, but they've just decided the community really wants me to stay on. Ah, ah, that's a noble teenager that makes, that makes that call, but yes, clear, clearly that is an option. Uh, there was another hand up. Yes, please. Um, my new public works director and I, as the mayor, sat down and talked about this, and the water pumps are actually under that water tower. Yep. There is electricity there, so yep. the sign is not a lie. Yep. The fence is not what's electrified. There are lights at the top of the tower that are powered. There is electricity, it has been a deterrent, so this is not an integrity problem. So there's some power that's at work somewhere in the confines of the fence. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, and we've just decided it's, it's Got it, got it. Okay. Any other points of view? Because I think you've really nailed them. Um, let's kind of look at some themes behind, yeah, please. I just have one, and that's the, and we talked about it, is that this is prevention, and prevention is TV cameras that aren't hooked up. It's placing police cars at intersections with no one in them. It's uh, having a dog bark, a mean dog when you don't have a dog. Uh, there's a lot, it's a preventive sign yeah. that has been a cost effective and worked for a long time. And I really don't think it quite gets to an integrity issue. Yeah, so if it is, then so is parking the police car, so is the barking dog sign, and yeah. or the uh, mean dog sign. So this is a deterrent. Yeah, it's, it's a deterrent. It's That's working effective. and it's serving its purpose. And so if it's creating a public good, and the public good here is safety, and it's keeping taxpayers' dollars down because you're not sending crews up all the time, then why not go ahead with it? Yeah, that's your point. Let's look at some of the themes that come out of this simple case. We've done this case with tons of organizations, thousands of leaders across the globe, literally, you can boil the approaches they're going to take into two principal camps. There's one set of people that look at an ethical dilemma and they make this, the decision based on something we call the law of consequences. Sometimes it's called consequentialism. That law says basically when you're facing an ethical dilemma, you look at the stakeholders who are going to be impacted by the decision you're about to make and you do whatever's going to create the greatest good for the largest number of people. Conversely, the least amount of harm for the largest number of people. There's another segment of the population that steps back and says, no, there's some principles that are very important, like truth and honesty and respect and transparency, and you never violate those. And those two voices rise in every organization. What we encourage leaders to do is to listen to both voices, and when you do, you start to synthesize the great points that are being made for <coughs> both voices. So as an example, those of you who were arguing, uh, leave the sign exactly as it is, I heard these themes coming from you, it's working. Why would you change something that's working? It was set up to be a deterrent, it's working, so if it ain't broke, why would you go ahead and try and fix something that's been working for the last five years? Uh, the other point was the other unintended consequence. What if you take this sign down and then somebody goes up and falls off and hurts themselves? How would you explain to their parents, because you were standing on integrity, you decided to change this sign that was working and there lies their child that's been harmed? Uh, and I, then I heard the message of uh, uh, sort of your responsibility here. It's you, you, you're a public official, keep costs down, and safety is very important. 
Those of you who were saying, wait a minute, I ran on a campaign promise of integrity, I gotta stand to that, you're coming from this principleist approach. Uh, literally, you're meeting with your first, uh, your first meeting with your department heads, and you're setting the tone for your administration. How do you want to make this first decision gets to be an approach some people think about when they're facing an ethical dilemma. And even when you say, you know, I want to electrify the fence a little bit, you're thinking about how to make the sign true. Uh, or maybe you take the high voltage off of it. It's still making the sign true. That's about the principleist approach. What we find in organizations, though, is that these two voices rise, these two approaches, and they will polarize. And when they polarize, they stop talking. Why? Because to continue talking would be to accuse my fellow worker of being unethical. Or maybe they would look at <coughs> my decision as unethical. So the discussion goes down in the meeting room, and the boss will make the decision, or whoever talks the loudest makes the decision. Then what happens is everybody around the table looks like they've just agreed to the decision. Oh, but there's a meeting that happens after the meeting where they start to undermine the decision that the leader has just made based on their own point of view. Can you believe it? We're going to leave that sign up. I thought we ran on a campaign of integrity for a change. Or can you believe it? We're going to take that sign down. And it's been working for so long. And they start to badmouth and undermine the decision. Worse yet, if they're in charge of communicating the decision to others, guess what? They're using similar filters to hear about the decision that's been made and interpret it. Um, and so what we encourage leaders to do is to move to that approach where you're listening to both points of view. We call this the synthesis approach. You're listening to the principles that are important and the impact of the decision on the stakeholders that are there. And when you do, that's where breakthrough thinking starts to come through. And I've heard a couple of these themes. One is, wait a minute, let's find a safer alternative for the kids. Let's take the danger out by putting a place for them to paint down on the ground and give them some uh, rewards, turn it into a community event, an experience. They get a chance to express themselves. The kids are one key stakeholder. I'm not sending crews up to clean off the uh, water tower. I'm saving the another t uh, stakeholder dollars, the taxpayer, and I'm keeping my crews safe. They could fall off and get hurt, and I'm getting rid of some of those unintended consequences. And so when you start to brainstorm, you get to these breakthrough areas. Now, generally speaking, what we've seen is, as I mentioned, uh, in most groups, you can split them in half. These views are there. Secondly, they don't reach consensus, just as we did in this room. You know, about half the group said, yep, we got to consensus, half didn't. Thirdly, if they let the walls come down from their own ethical perspective, you'll hear new information. And about 60% of you raised your hand and said, yep, I heard something I would not have considered. Leadership is about understanding your own point of view, how you would make the decision, being open to alternative points of view, Still, sometimes you've got to make the decision, and it may be different than others' point of view, but when you make it, you can explain the basis for the decision, how you consider both the principles as well as the impact of that decision on the stakeholders. And it will equip the people you're working with to be able to go out and communicate the decision more effectively. That's the takeaway. Unfortunately, this doesn't happen in organizations. And what happens is, people see this trickle-down effect of decisions, and it's not lining up with who we say we are as an organization, and so they translate that into, well, if they can make those decisions here, it's okay for me over here to make my decisions that may violate principles in the name of some stakeholder. Last point I'd make is, um, the further up in the organization you are, the more you're going to have to consider the impact of your decisions on stakeholders. And if you're a person whose bias is to come from the principled approach, you'll feel some internal churn uh, within you as you go to make that decision. That's okay. Um, that's good because as long as you're hearing that churn, that's your conscience, that's your ethics actually talking. But you've got to balance it with thinking about the impact of that decision on other stakeholders. And sometimes that means surrounding yourself with people who may have different perspectives than you do. 
right along with that, be careful if, if when you get these tough issues on the table, and this is a simple one, but when they get more complex, be careful if there's no discussion in the room about other options. What that means is you may have surrounded yourself with people that are just like you, all right, and they're going to block out another approach. Um, so you got to either, one, make sure you've empowered others to get these points of view on the table, or sometimes you may have to reverse roles from the place where you're most comfortable in order to get that issue out on the table. That's what leadership is all about. Everybody with me so far? Okay, that's the takeaway from there. What I'm going to do now is just give you some data about what does it take to build and sustain an ethical culture. And uh, I'll walk through this real quickly in about 15, 20 minutes, and we'll still have about 10 minutes or so for any final questions that you might have. Um, uh, why does it matter uh, to get the culture right? Well, to cut through it, there are a lot of unethical themes that are going on around the globe today. Uh, we track a lot of surveys, and I'll give you some quick insights. If you survey um, uh, through the Edelman Trust Group, they'll tell you today that 18, only 18% 18 of people have trust and confidence that business leaders are going to do the right thing. If you ask employees, uh, what are they seeing in the workplace, 56% of them would say, we observe unethical behavior in the workplace pretty regularly, and they call unethical behavior theft, lying to supervisors, falsifying financial information, falsifying hours that are actually work and discrimination, and rampant conflicts of interest. It's one thing to see it, but will you report it? 42% of employees will say, I've seen unethical behavior, but I'm not about to report it. Why? Fear. Uh, somebody's going to retaliate against me, or cynicism. Nobody's going to do anything about it anyway, so why should I put my neck on the line? Worse yet, when you talk to ethics officers, they will tell you that 22% of, of, of the uh, 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 cases that are out there that they've experienced, and these ethics officers, see that their company really tolerates people who don't live up to the ethical standards because they're great performers. That sends a message to the organization that it's the results that matter, not the behavior you exhibit as you go get those results. Actually, 5% of those ethics officers surveyed said their companies actually promote great performers even if they don't live up to the ethical standards. And that sends a loud and clear message to the organization about what's important. There's a disconnect between what leaders see at the top and what people at the front line are seeing. This is from a business partner we work with, uh, Conexa, when surveyed and asked the question, do the leaders do a great job of communicating the values, the behavioral expectations? 78% of executives say, we do great work in this space. Only about 41% of people on the front line would actually agree. And lastly, when you look at the next generation coming up, uh, sort of the ethical boundaries are being pushed. 56% of MBA students across the country readily admit to having cheated on at least three occasions uh, within the last 12 months. Plagiarism, uh, sort of getting advanced copies of exams, etc. And in high school, 40% of students would say they would lie, cheat, steal if they knew they would never get caught in order to make more money or to get ahead. That tells us as leaders, we need to be thoughtful about investing and in get, getting the culture right. Because if we don't, it costs. And ethics does cost if there are breakdowns. Specific examples, the fraud examiners, and some uh, groups that go around uh, sort of trying to quantify the cost of these ethical breakdowns came up with some interesting data. One, 25% uh, of fraud cases are at least a million dollars or more. In addition to that, I'll put them all up. 27% um, of fraud cases actually involve corruption. About half of them, 46%, are discovered by tip rather than audits. And so it's important that we create a culture where people feel comfortable coming forward and sharing what's going on. The typical fraud doesn't get discovered for at least a couple of years. Uh, unless you've created a culture where people will raise their hand and say, uh, yep, something's going wrong here, and we know this is not what's tolerated. You go back to 2006, the estimates were you could equate fraud going on inside of organizations to about 5% of the revenues. That would equate to $652 billion. That survey recently done in 2008 shows that the number has grown to almost 7% of annual revenues. So it costs. We bail out the country. That's wrong. <laughs> 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 Absolutely.
absolutely, if we could just <laughs> eliminate what's going on there. Well, there are a couple themes we really encourage organizations to think about. Get the culture right. When we talk about ethical culture, it's pretty basic. It's about uh, integrity, uh, transparency, and respect, and truthfulness. It's about understanding the laws of the land, but also how do I make sure I comply with societal standards, but it's in the gray area where ethical cultures excel. They're always reaching for the highest standards of behavior. We think there's a method to the madness in terms of creating an ethical culture. First of all, individuals as well as organizations are on a journey, and that journey starts from a self-interest perspective. What's in it for me? How do I maximize for my own gain? It, get influenced, it gets influenced along the way by the laws of the land, the rules and the regulations. If you violate them, somebody's going to get in trouble. Or the market set standards. Customers aren't going to buy from you if you act like this. But breaking through those boundaries, those bumpers, so to speak, is what great organizations do. And they start to reach for a higher standard of behavior that they expect from people in the organization. And we call that ethical culture. There are five elements that are tied to it. One, leaders are great at setting the tone in the organization. They lay the foundation for what's actually expected. They make sure they're always thinking about the stakeholders that are impacted by the decisions they're making. And they think about the processes in the business. How does it reinforce the behavior that we actually want? And they're constantly assessing, testing, to, testing to see are we making progress on this journey. A few comments about each of those. From a leadership standpoint, it is about setting the tone at the top. And frequently, leaders are viewed as asking people to do something unethical when that is really not what they're saying at all. Um, people will listen to that, especially when it comes to pressure to perform, and they'll translate that into, really, it's about the performance. That's all that matters here. The ends will justify the means. Let's get the results at all costs. Leaders have to be aware that there are these two languages that get spoken in every organization. There's one about performance. What do we need to accomplish? Whether you're a for-profit, non-profit, government organization, it matters not. The other voice, though, is about behavior. What are the standards of behavior that are important here as we go about accomplishing these objectives? What happens in most organizations is you can have very ethical leaders, but if they don't balance those messages, if they focus on the results, people translate that into it's about results at all costs. That's where organizations start to get into trouble. Secondly, Organizations are great at uh, that getting the, the culture right are great at laying the foundation. That's old fashioned in some senses. I agree with Christopher in his message this morning. It's about being clear on the mission, the purpose of the organization, the vision, what's that compelling story that gets us up every morning. But then the two most powerful ways that you influence behavior in an organization are through the shared values, those behavioral standards that you set in place, and the ethics and compliance codes that tell you where the laws and the rules and the regulations are. To look at those more, more specifically, values are nothing more than those shared norms or beliefs that guide behavior. They're aspirational in nature. They're directional. They're principles. They speak to stakeholders and how we're going to serve them. And they speak to the character of the organization. Ethics and compliance codes tend to be more prescriptive. They tell you what we're going to do in specific situations. They tend to look backwards, though, at where the risks are, where breakdowns have occurred, and here's some rules to attend to those. They're not very good looking forward to tell you what should you anticipate, and that's the beauty of the values. Uh, Roy Snell mentioned this at the top, so I won't go into a lot of detail on it other than to say there are these federal sentencing guidelines. Uh, I actually served for two years on an advisory group to the United States Sentencing Commission that actually puts these guidelines in place. What happens to businesses and individuals if there is a legal violation of the law? Um, those guidelines were updated in 2004 to include an emphasis on ethical conduct. That was one of the sort of things I, I had to contribute with several others was to focus on not just complying with the law, but what's the, how does ethical culture and ethical conduct actually play? Uh, Roy touched on this earlier. There are seven steps that the regulators look for in any organization. 
Uh, have you gotten the procedures, the rules down so people understand what's expected? Have you communicated it? Uh, do the people that are in charge understand what's expected and does it permeate throughout the organization? Uh, and what about training? Uh, and do you audit to find out uh, what the behavior of the organization looks like? And if you do, if there are problems, do you address them or do you let them go because it's a high performer that's involved that may be causing the problem and you don't want to run the risk of losing them? These steps are looked at pretty carefully by organizations that are trying to get their culture right. Right along with that, if there is a breakdown, this is where the authorities will come in and look. They'll start asking questions about your ethics and compliance program and they'll want to know, are you using these steps? And they'll not just talk to you as leaders, they'll go drilling down in the organization to see what they can find there as well. Now there's clarity about the role of the board in this area. Uh, what's the role of decision makers like yourselves, but the people who have day-to-day -day operating responsibilities. They have a charge to make sure they're working on getting the culture right. Stakeholders are very important. Uh, there are an array of them. Each organization defines their own. And when you're making decisions, as we saw in the Happy Hills case, you have to think about the implication of that decision on a variety of stakeholders. It makes it very complex, frankly, because they have different e needs. Sometimes they're competing interests, uh, and it's hard to satisfy them all the time. But you have to be conscious and, and, and thinking about what are the impacts of the decisions that I'm actually making. Um, uh, and then the toughest area to get right is to get your business processes lined up. These are some areas where we see risk in terms of ethical breakdowns occurring, but what goes along with these business functions that may cause the risk is sometimes we use the business processes to send the wrong signal about what behavior we want. So how you hire people, how you fire people, how you train people, how you communicate and incentivize them and recognize them and appraise them, all of that sends loud and clear messages about what the organization values. So the job of a leader is to create the mission and the vision and the values, but it's also to get into the systems to make sure they line up with the values that you hold very dearly. Um, let me wrap up with just a couple of data points and then we'll go to questions that you might have. We do a lot of surveying with a business partner that's called Connects, and I'm going to give you just a few high points of some of the study work we're doing. We in essence have created five questions uh, clearly along these ethics themes. Do senior leaders walk the talk? <coughs> uh, do, does my company do a good job of, of balancing the interests of multiple stakeholders, or is it just about the stockholder? What about coworkers? Is their behavior consistent with the values of the organization, or is something else being recognized and rewarded? Can I discuss ethical issues without fears of uh, consequences? And lastly, what gets rewarded around here? Can I get promoted uh, if I don't live the values, or do I have to live the values in order to get ahead in the business? What we've done with Conexa is each year we've been surveying about 10,000 employees across the country. And the last year, we actually started surveying internationally. So now we're surveying in 13 different countries, asking these questions and getting feedback. I'm going to give you just a few snapshots of some of the data we're getting back because it tells a pretty interesting story. First, if you take the countries that we surveyed, and you combine those five questions, we've actually put them on an index. We call that an integrity index. And we're starting to measure who falls within plus or minus five points of the norm. In this case, the norm uh, falls somewhere between 40 and 50 points. And you'll see uh, that right in the middle, 45, you'll find the Netherlands and Mexico uh, falling down below the norm, you'll find countries like China and Russia. Japan actually fell in at the bottom of the data that we were collecting. You'll see India and the US tend to be up toward the top of the norm around these areas that we're measuring. If you go directly to the US, I'm going to give you three years worth of data on those five questions. Stakeholders, do we balance their interests? What about uh, senior management? Do we do a great job in terms of communicating ethical standards? We've given you the percentage of employees who would answer very favorably with those responses. So if we just looked at the last year we took the data, 2000, reported the data, 2008, you'll see there's a nice uptick in each of these categories. It's the kind of teal blue. 
The way to read that is 66% of employees would say, yep, we do a good job of balancing the interests of stakeholders. About two thirds. One third would say, no, it's really about the stockholders in our business. Same with respect to ethical leaders. Uh, do they really communicate behavioral expectations? The area that's the most troubling is what does it take to advance in the organization? This tends to score the lowest, even though the numbers are trending up. Only about half of employees would say behavior counts, and that gets rewarded and recognized in the organization. Now, you can take the same index and start to then look at industries. So we've now sliced the employees by industry to start to say, where might there be some risk? Now that's not to say that companies operating in these industries are not ethical. But what it does say is employees are saying we see some behavior that would put us at risk if we're not careful. Uh, this was taken the latter part of 07 and reported in 08, so given what's going on in the banking services industry, I think you might see some shifts in the next set of surveys that we actually do. But the end of last year and early this year, these are the industries that would be scoring above the norm healthcare products and business services, electronics and computer manufacturing and banking, um, toward the bottom of the norm, uh, government uh, tends to come in toward the tail end in terms of their employees thinking they're working at building an ethical culture. And actually, uh, food, the food industry, light manufacturing and heavy manufacturing were lower last year, but they've moved within plus or minus five points of the norm. Does that restaurant include fast food as yep. well as life? Yep, okay. yep, it does. Uh, we also see uh, differences in terms of how the employees in an organization respond. Uh, managers and executives tend to score very highly the ethical fabric, the ethical core of their organization. But when you move down to the middle of the organization and to the front line, the numbers start to drop. And I think that's a risk for companies, because this is where the rubber meets the road. These are where the transactions are happening with your various stakeholders. And so it raises the flag and says, gee, how do we as leaders start to get in front of this and communicate so we're actually closing the gap that's there? Uh, last chart I'll end up with is uh, how uh, ethics can be of value if you're investing in getting the culture right. So what we've done on this chart is we've taken that same ethics integrity measure that I just described with the five questions. Then we've looked at the data and we've said, what percentage of the employees feel strongly that their company's building an ethical culture versus who feels, no, we're not investing in an ethical culture? Uh, then what we've started to do is to correlate that to other business indicators about what's happening with the employee from an engagement standpoint. So the way to read this chart is in companies who, where employees feel they have, their company is invested in building a strong ethical culture, 95% of those or 93% of those employees would say we take great pride in the place we work but where employees feel they have a weak ethical culture, only 16% of those employees would say, um, I take great pride in the place where I work. You can start to see the correlations. What about job satisfaction? Same numbers. If the employees feel they're working in a strong ethical culture, 92% of them would say I'm satisfied with the place where I work. If they don't feel they've got a strong ethical culture, only 14% would agree. Here's the big one that business leaders like to look at, it's retention. If employees feel I'm working in a culture that's a strong ethical culture, uh, you'll see 83% of them say, I plan on sticking around. But if they don't feel they're working in a strong ethical culture, only about 14% say, I plan on sticking around for the long term. And that's a business driver. That means you're losing people, you gotta pay the cost to go out and find others, <coughs> etc. And you can see some of the other areas that uh, we've touched on. Uh, let me stop there and uh, open it up for questions that you might have. We've got about 10 minutes uh, left. Uh, a couple takeaways, I'll hit those. We talked about sort of this uh, different approaches that go on inside of an organization. We looked at that with the Happy Hills case and the job of a leader is to begin to create alignment there. And then I shared with you some data, trends that are going on in the workplace and how responsible organizations are working hard to get the culture right. What questions can I respond to? Yeah, please. Yeah. 
I think the thing on the government was a little bit surprising to some extent. Do you, do you have any uh, ideas of what, what might be driving that or, or why, why uh, they would do that? A uh, couple thoughts. Uh, one, um, some of it is uh, busy, fixated making rules um, for everybody else and not applying those rules to themselves. Um, secondly, sometimes we see a gap when we've worked with government organizations between the elected officials who come and go uh, and people down in the organization see that they have different motives. Uh, some of it might be for just their constituency and so they'll have lots of conflicts of interest going on versus thinking about what's in the interest of the greater good, all of the constituents, constituents that they're supposed to serve. Uh, sometimes those who are in sort of paid administrative posts that are not subject to election um, will create subcultures and there's a disconnect between what people at the top may want because they view them as transient, they're going to be gone tomorrow, so why should we change just to live up to who they are? And so they never really get to what are the real issues, what's the real culture we're trying to build here for the long term? And we see that going on as well there. Yeah, please. Yeah. To that same end, it seems to me that the, you're, you're applying the, the same standards to a commercial culture versus a governmental culture mm -hmm. may not be the right approach to try to determine because for the very reasons you mentioned, that you have the transients, mm -hmm. the politicians right. who are not there for the long term, some of them are, that they don't necessarily plan to do. Or you have the, the paid administrators who might be viewed differently, and, and what kind of disconnects are there between those two groups yeah. that are filtering down or being perceived differently by right. the rank and file? Right. Uh, I hear your point, but we would still argue that even if you're a paid official that's there for the long term, as a leader, You've got an obligation to help craft a vision for what your organization is going to do to serve constituents, and as well as set the behavioral standards. Go ahead. I understand that, but I also understand what politicians are. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that, that creates a whole different culture yeah. in my perception. I would agree, and that's what we hear when we work with um, uh, governmental organizations. We hear that loud and clear. We work with city counties, cities and counties, and state groups, and it's. Uh, um, we feel like we need, we know the direction we need to go and what's the right thing, but sometimes there's this tension. I have just run on a campaign for this, and even though you may be going there, that's not what I've said to my constituents. So how do you, how do you balance that? How do you make that work? When did you leave the U.S. West? In 19... Before or after? Oh, before. I left in the 1995. I think Quest bought U.S. West in about 1998. And what leads me to that question was, Nacio, as you probably familiar, is being prosecuted. Yep. And for some of the very reasons that you mentioned, the results are even was the only thing, yep. according to the testimony you've heard. And I heard that long before the lawsuit was that was the only thing that happened. Yeah. It's a personal experience from working for an organization that had a great, a fabulous culture. Uh, I worked there for 24 years. It was Northwestern Bell, part of the old Bell system, then became U.S. West when the Bell system broke up. And uh, focused on mission and values and stakeholders. Uh, but then uh, another company comes in, takes over, brings in a leader who's very focused on the results by any means necessary. And without getting into the detail, uh, use stretch some accounting principles would be uh, using mild language. Um, but um, that plus sort of the telecom industry uh, going soft. Uh, if you watched uh, Quest stock, I left in 95, the stock reached a high when it was US West of about 66 bucks a share. Nacho, who was the CEO at the time, came in, took it over, uh, really started to push the envelope, get aggressive, got caught. Um, and with everything else that was going on in the industry, the stock dropped from 66 bucks a share to 66 cents a share. Uh, and that happened within a year. 
and there were many long-term employees and friends of mine that had their entire net worth kind of baked into company stock, you know, 401k plans and that was stock the culture that I grew up as you mentioned. Yeah, people people I'm, knew they I'm were from Denver. So. Oh, okay. Um, then, of course, you know the detail. Then people knew that that was a safe place to make an investment. You saw that go down the two, but it's never quite rebounded. I think it's gotten up as high as five or six bucks. Only got up to eight dollars. Eight years ago. And, and now I think it's down back around two or three. Three. So that's the impact that a leader can have if they aren't trying to to get things done the right way. I've never been a quest or U.S. West or Mountain Valley before. So now you want to disown us. <laughs> no, I understand. It, it, it's, it's tough. It's tough on employees that are inside of the organization as well. Other questions I can uh, respond to? Please. Well, I mean, I have the same feeling about, you know, the government being ranked yep. at the bottom of your survey. Yep. Because from my personal experience, work at the, you know, at the private industry for many different organizations, and then have now worked for the state government agency at various agencies. And I had personal experience at the state government agencies, the ethical environment is so much better and so much higher and so much emphasis was put on the ethics culture yep. versus in the private industry or the corporate world. Yep. So that is totally the opposite of what, you know, I mean, the government there, if you're talking about the elected official, the politician, we know that general public don't trust the politician. Mm -hmm. But to say the government is not as ethical in your so, you know, it's just pretty confusing. And keep in mind, these are, these are employees giving us their feedback, okay? So we randomly select the employees from around the country, and this is their perception of those five themes. Um, do the leaders do a great job of setting examples? And you know, they look up and they see some elected officials, and yes, they say some. Sometimes, sometimes they say no. Um, what about um, uh, being clear on mission and where we're going, and then making sure people get recognized and rewarded for their commitment? This is the feedback we're getting from them. This certainly is opposite from my own experience. Mm -hmm. I, I, yes. I have a perspective too about that, and I think that to some degree governments um, have a higher standard of things to meet and, and everything's transparent. It's in the public eye. So mm -hmm. nothing goes by or less goes by unnoticed. Or in the corporate world, you can hide stuff better. They're not uh, required, you're not an official. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's just more to be seen and that that can make a difference. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um I'll, uh, I don't have the data with me now, but we do track a lot of ethical breakdowns that have occurred in different industries, and frankly, we can find just as many ethical breakdowns that have occurred in government as you're seeing in private industry um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the classic ones we kind of keep track on is that stuff that went on in the city of San Diego. Um, um, those of you that are in the investment area know how they were investing dollars, and that sort of blew up on them. And they've been struggling still. I know they've gone through several mayors and city managers, et cetera. Uh, and so sometimes people make choices uh, that end up coming to blow up on them. And we see a number of cases like that. We see cases of influence, improper influence, conflicts of interest, where I'm using my office to get things that benefit me personally. So. I'm not saying that to get down on government. I'm saying um, greed and unethical behavior is not just limited to one particular sector. I mean, it's a human issue. It cuts across all sectors. And the antidote for it, frankly, we think is investing and getting it right. Um, and, I, and again, I think I was careful when I put that data up. I, I wanted to be careful to say, even though I'm going to show you how employees are ranking, uh, and how it stacks up their own industries. That's not to say every organization in that industry is like that, okay? But from the employees where we gather feedback, that's the messages they were giving us. Uh, I have one more question. Any others? If not, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.